Thank you so much for all of you who have taken your time today to join us. I have to say it's with incredible humility that I'm talking to you today. Incredible humility. You as educators have gone through a period of time unlike any other in our history. And while rightfully so, first responders and um, medical staff have gotten recognized, I don't think we have recognized you to the degree that you need to be recognized. You know, I've been um, trying to figure out how we could have a huge party for you, but I haven't figured out yet how to get um, my favorite bottles of Chardonnay to you. So when we figure that out, we're going to have a really big party. So, um, and maybe we'll have a smaller one that is not with Chardonnay. I don't know yet, but we're thinking about it. Okay. I start with bringing into the room the reason we're here. And I love this picture. To me, it shows the vibrancy of young people. It shows hope. It shows energy and dedication. And this is why we're here today, to ensure that these young people get what they need to make good on that hope. I want to point out, if you didn't see this woman in the middle, that one of my goals in the presentation, there's a lot of information that I'm going to share with you, but one of my goals is that you don't look like that at the end of the presentation, that you have in fact been energized and have some ideas to work with. And I'm going to give you the chance at the end of the presentation to share with me a small change that this presentation has perhaps um, elicited. I believe strongly that the best way in which we make big changes is through the kindnesses, the interactions, the things we do on an interpersonal and day-to-day -day basis. And I'm going to give you a chance for sharing your small change. And then I'm going to share uh, with some of the people we'll, we'll choose um, to send you some books. I can't send everybody a book, but I will send as many as I can. I hope that there's something in what I talk about that confirms a practice, uh, reminds you of something that maybe fell by the wayside, or that brings some new idea to you, just even a very small one. And because the situation is so urgent right now, I have to tell you that as an educator, I have felt the compunction to tell you everything I know, which in a 50 minute talk is not a very good idea. But I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground, and I'm hopeful, though, that there's a three-part message here. One is that kids need to be brought back to the page, and that that page needs to provide them with information. What we need to do is build kids' knowledge. The second big idea is that for some kids, a digital program that gives them focused attention and monitors where they are and what they're doing is going to be critical. And finally, I'm going to talk about virtual read-alouds. Uh, I think that we don't want to forget the role that literature can have in helping us remember who we are and also in giving us solace. So I'm going to spend some time on the beginning part here reminding us of why we're so concerned about kids reading. I think sometimes when we forget the why and we're doing things, it can really lose the intensity that we need in terms of our instruction. This is a very crude representation of how access to knowledge for an average human being has changed over the last 35 years. This past fall, I was able to go to some um, libraries in Western Europe. And I looked at these libraries that had been there for hundreds of years. Some of these books were um, almost a thousand years old. And I realized that in my hand, 
I held access to all of these books because almost all of them have been scanned. And then all of the other books that have been written. We live in an age of information. And texts are fundamental to accessing that information. And it truly is a case of those who have knowledge are going to have some very different experiences over the next um, decades, century, than those who can't access knowledge. So it, people have studied what kind of information you convey and what kind of information you get from books and also from conversations. So if we look here at two college-educated adults, when people have documented what they say, it turns out that the number of rare words in a conversation, not the kind that I'm having with you today, because I use some erudite words, but the kind that is typical in a coffee shop, when we went to coffee shops, is going to be less, contain fewer rare words than even the books that we read to toddlers. This is a really significant thing. So up to a certain point in your life, you get your information from oral language. But in fact, it turns out that if that information source becomes the only one you have, that it is very difficult for you to gain access to some ideas that often are raised in conversations, you know, like seismic plates, um, volcanoes, um, all kinds of things that even things about caterpillars and bears that we typically don't talk about in conversations. We know from work on the brain that what you know influences how you comprehend. In fact, the relationship is a very, very close one. But at the same time, what it is that you know actually gets extended, it gets expanded from text. So it's a two-way relationship. So the reason we teach kids to read isn't because it's just a nice thing, like it was considered a nice thing if somebody played the violin or piano when I was a kid. What's important about reading is that it's about what we learn from the reading. So today, I'm going to use a GPS to talk with you on our journey. There are actually going to be two main destinations. I use a GPS because sometimes I can get kind of free-ranging, you know, like some of the chickens, in terms of the ideas that I talk about. So I want to keep us on track. The thing about words are that they're the ways in which we codify, we document concepts. And it turns out that 2,500 word families account for the majority of the words in text. And these aren't words to be memorized. So let's talk about those. And then the second half of the presentation, well, actually more than half, but the second major point on the GPS is going to be what we do about this as teachers. I know as an educator and also as a human being, I'm very action oriented. And I know that that's where we want to get to. But if we don't know why we're doing something, I think that we can really get um, uh, astray from our main purposes. So it turns out that English has just an enormous number of words. Around well over 600,000 in the Oxford English Dictionary. And by the way, these are single entries in the dictionary. And some words, like the word set, can have 32 or 33 different meanings. So it turns out we've got a lot of ways to describe our experiences and the knowledge in the world. Now, in any book that we give kids, and today I'm really going to be focusing on third grade. I think that's a point where we've often been very worried. In, in education, we've um, in some states come up with guidelines or mandates to ensure that kids uh, come to certain levels by the end of third grade. But it turns out that in most books, 
authentic literature, we find an enormous number of different words. So in this book, Me and Uncle Romy, these are all the different words in the text. Among these words are about 50 words that don't occur very often. I'm calling those rare words. And a rare word doesn't mean that you don't know what it means. It means it doesn't appear in text a lot. So for example, a word like buckle or bubble doesn't appear in text a lot. So from all these words, I was intrigued with the words that were pulled out for instruction. It turns out in the last textbook adoptions, and I know many of you might not use core reading programs, but I'm suggesting the same principles underlie our curricular materials. So in these two programs, here are the words that were selected uh, by one program and then by the, the other. And what you see here are two words were shared, ruined, and feast. But I took a look at these and thought, does this convey the real ideas behind this text? Does this text tell you something about the boy James, who's coming of age on a visit to New York to his uncle and aunt? Does it tell you anything about his famous uncle who was a collage artist? I don't think so. And it seemed to me that a lot of these words were either so rare, like the word yanked, or sufficiently commonplace, like cardboard, that to spend a week of instruction on this set of words didn't seem to me a particularly good idea. So I asked myself, is it possible for us to use the resources that come from the digital world? You know, now we can scan books. And furthermore, there are researchers across the world who have come up with interesting ways to analyze groups of words. Kapora, we call them. Okay, There are these big databases. Google obviously has a huge one, but there are big databases of the words that appear in children's texts. So what I did is I took 10,000 texts that I'd had scanned, and I created something called the Word Zone Analyzer. And all of the features of the analyzer aren't here, but it has about 12 features that in a nanosecond, can tell me all the words in me and Uncle Romy, any other book, and in fact, in thousands of books at one time. And it tells us what words are all of these features, by the way, word length, predicted times, the frequency, the age at which it comes into a child's um, oral vocabulary, the size of the words that share the same root word, and also how concrete words are. Abstract words are harder to learn than words that are very concrete. All of these words have been shown to influence word recognition. So I asked myself, could we use this knowledge to create a different kind of vocabulary instruction? And I'm going to say it's a way in which to select text because the words in the text are what makes the ideas in the text are what makes text easy. Or challenging for students. So my next step was to um, look not just at the 2,500 words, but we've actually now established that in the next band there are 2,500 additional 2,500 families. But what I found was that when we applied these analyses, that over 90% of the words could be accounted for by a group of families of words. And a family is, for example, help, helpful, helpless, unhelpful, helper, or helping. Okay, that's a family. So it turns out, and so when you see 2,500 families, there are a lot more than 2,500 words in this yellow group. There are, in fact, about 12,000 words. Okay, so what you see is that as you go up, that there are many more words but they don't account for as much of the text. That doesn't mean that they aren't important words. But what I'm gonna suggest today is that if you aren't highly facile, automatic, with these words in yellow, it's gonna be a really hard process for you to assimilate and to give meaning to the words that are rarer. 
Okay, so one of the things that I did is, is this really valid? Had I found a group of words that were really important? We've known about the Dolch words, uh, you know, 100 words account for about 48% of the words that you read. But was this group of um, word families ones that, in fact, accounted for the words in text? I had all of the texts that the Common Core Standards folks seemed to think were exemplars. I had all those texts scanned, well over a million words. And what I established is the word families don't all appear all at once. As you can see, it's a steady addition. And some of these right at the end here are much more abstract. But what you're seeing here is that at the very beginning levels, it's a high percentage of words that are accounted for by the um, by these families. In this case, about 1,300 of them. But even up to high school, excuse me, college and career ready, we're seeing that these families are really important. Now, I want to point out, I hope that you can see this, that across the gamut, these words are going to appear. And as well as knowing about the frequency of words, we also know that if it's a high quality text, there are going to be some new words in every hundred words. So even a text that's often used with first graders or at the beginning levels of reading, like Whistle for Willie, what you're seeing, and I'm not suggesting you can't figure out these words, you probably know what a carton is, but you've probably not seen that word in text before. An opportunity have to have seen words influences how quickly and well I can recognize them. Okay, so I look at Charlotte's Web, moving a little further up the grades, and then tuck after everlasting. Here we're seeing about what we're seeing six words per hundred. And the giver often used it more in middle grades, middle school. The, the words can change in their complexity, like fascinated. We are starting to see more multisyllabic words. And by the way, we see a lot of names in these texts. That's an important thing that could be a topic of another session of how we deal with names. But what I want to point out here is that these yellow words, the 2,500 word families, are prominent. But we've also got the task of words beyond that, the rare words, appearing in every hundred words you read. Some of the words, like the names of characters, will be repeated, but often the words aren't repeated. A word like um, fascinated may appear only a single time. And for kids who are depending on schools for their primary instruction, this can be a really challenging thing. Okay, here are some examples of the words. Yes, the first hundred fall into that category of Dolch words. But as you go through the group, you see a really a lot of words that we call academic words, also words that have to do with topics like um, valleys and civilization, social studies, and also science words. Now, one of the things when people have heard that I've done this work is the first level of response is give me the list. And I've been reluctant to distribute a list. Now at Text Project, we provide uh, pictures of a lot of the words in the 2500. We're about to post semantic word families, highlight multiple meaning words in the 2500. But we've had a tradition of word lists in the word lists in the United States, starting with Thorndike in 1921, almost 100 years. And the thing is, these aren't words to be memorized. And why do I say that? These words represent critical topic information. So students need to be understanding the connections between words and groups, words that are semantically shared. And there are about, as you saw there, about 10 really big topics. And it turns out that these topics like jobs are things that also occur in, in narrative, in stories. I want to underscore today that when I'm talking about knowledge, 
I'm not excluding stories. Stories are a primary way in which we get to know knowledge of how we function in the social world. We can hear about people's anticipations of the future. We can also read about how people thought about things in the past. And in stories, all of these words, these groups of words are important. And they're also the basis of our content area instruction. Another thing, obviously, because we parse the words by morphological families, is that they represent morphological knowledge. As I said, each of the families has about five members and the families of our different types. And this is an important thing that we could spend another session on. Um, and if you go to Text Project, there's a, we have spent a lot of time talking about how these three layers of English, you know, so the bottom layer is where the most words are. They're the words we typically use for phonics instruction. And they're very prolific in the use of compounding. And often the compound words, you know, like um, a doghouse is a house where a dog lives, but a firehouse isn't a house on fire or where a fire lives. Turns out that's where firemen or fire people stay. Okay, so each of these layers of English derive or create new words in different ways. And learning about the 2,500 word families, this is part of learning about them, which is why you can't get that through memorization. The final feature of the 2,500 families is that most of the words, not only are there five different morphological members, but there are at least five different meanings for the lead words, and then more meanings when you consider some of the um, the words that are in the families. Okay, so words often have some very distinct meanings. In some cases, they can almost be um, antithetical, almost opposites. Okay, so this isn't about teaching kids a list of words. It's about ensuring that they read enough so they become facile with the meanings of the words, with the networks across the words, and with the ways in which the words act as morphological families. So now I'm going to go. So, so what I've said today is we're teaching kids to read because it's a knowledge foundation. We're also teaching kids to get very automatic with the 2,500 morphological families because they're central in the text and in the ideas that we have in our lives, not only in our texts. Hey, um, I did say, right, that I'm going to actually give you six landmarks to watch out for. Some of the landmarks, it's going to be kind of like if you do a hop on, hop, hop off tour, like in Europe. Some of the landmarks are going to be very quick. I'm going to pass them by very quickly, and additional information can be obtained. And um, Suzanne, I think I need to provide a list of some of the sources that people can look at that we can send to the people who registered for this. Okay, so the first landmark is that kids need to read a lot of text. Now, this is going to seem kind of um, so obvious. You're thinking, and I signed up for this. Um, it's important to revisit. Why do I say that? Well, it turns out that in American reading instruction, we actually, um, my circles changed their shapes. This one, the one on the right is supposed to be substantially bigger than the one on the, the left. I apologize for that. So we've increased the amount of time kids are spending in reading instruction. But the amount of time kids are actually reading in the classroom is less. I began asking, why is that? And this is before we had any any kind of sheltering in place, before kids were in virtual learning situations. A lot of kids weren't reading that much. And it turns out that when they were reading, so um, Sharon Vaughn's colleagues at University of Texas, Austin, did a study to find out how much reading was going on in a 50-minute social studies or English period from grades seven to 12. And they found out that it was a respectable amount. So you can see the green chunk there. 
But that green chunk represented by this circle turned out that 80% of the time students were reading, they were listening or following along to somebody reading orally, whether it was a peer, their teacher, or an audio. Now, it's really hard to get good at reading. You can learn things through listening. But it's really hard to become proficient by only listening to other people read. What I say is that we've actually outsourced reading for kids, and somebody else is doing that. I see a lot of opportunities to go to the audio on different programs. And for the kids for whom reading is the most tedious, that's the first line that they're going to take. They're going to choose that. Now, I began asking, why do I think we've decreased the amount of reading and increased the amount of time? By the way, we could have a whole conversation about the effect of following along after kids are about in second grade when other people are reading orally. That's not a great way to develop great silent reading habits. Doesn't mean we never have oral reading. It means that we have oral reading for purposes while people are listening to find out whether the answer they had might be shared, for example. Okay, so what I want to ask is, why has this happened? Well, I think that as a member of the research community, I've been part of this conversation. You might not be using a core reading program, but whatever program you're using, there's probably a lot of curricular documentation. I look at um, Pinterest. I look at um, different sites where uh, curriculum materials are sold by teachers, <clears throat> by publishers, and I see a lot of advice to what to do around stories. What I'm seeing here is that over a 50-year period, we have it's 10 times more advice for teachers in the mid-2020, um, 2000 teens um, than it was in 1965. And what I'm going to suggest is every time a researcher like me comes up with a new strategy, we add it into our repertoire, but we don't take out something else. So finally, we've gotten so much information that we think we have to tell kids that the amount of reading that they do is very little because we're telling them so much. We're asking them so many questions. I also think one of the reasons we've been doing a lot of teachers doing the reading for kids or having them listen to a tape is our perceptions that the texts have gotten harder as a result of common core like mandates, and it's too hard for kids. This is a perception about the text. It's a perception about our kids. And a question here is, is that true? Is that right? Well, let's take a look at, um, this is an old version of the Dibbles, but the uh, I think the uh, new edition has some similar traits. And please don't think that I'm um, um, denigrating this program. I'm using it as a demonstration because it's widely used and, and from the research we've done is fairly typical of oral reading assessments. Okay, what you see is, oh, look, the five words, five rare words per hundred, oh, those might not be unknown words to kids, but I'm saying when they approach them in the text, especially broccoli and spinach, it may be that they haven't seen those words in text before and have trouble reading them. Okay, so that's what the task looks like. This is what the Dibbles data indicates. Kids at the 50th percent, so that's the, the middle kids. It actually turns out that they're reading a respectable amount. That's a nice rate for reading for third graders because, you know, eight-year-olds don't talk that fast. And you don't, you don't read a lot faster than you, uh, than you typically speak. Their accuracy is really high. That's amazing to me. When you go to the next group of kids at the 25th percentile, you see that uh, the accuracy has gone down a little bit. But there are a lot of words that they still know. And their automaticity is a little less. It takes them longer to figure those words out. At the 10th percentile, oh, but by the way, 
People have typically said that with 96%, you should still be able to get a pretty good idea of what the text is about. Now at 92%, uh, you can comprehend some things, but the reading is getting a lot more tedious. And now we've got kids at the fifth percentile. They can read some words, but 88% accuracy is going to be a challenge for them. What's the solution here? These kids are going to need to read some text that have been graduated on the 2,500 words, but it's not treating them like they can't read at all. So what I'm saying is for kids who weren't reading much before, trust me on this, that if we administer oral reading fluency measures when we're back in virtual or blended or face-to-face -face situations, they're going to be slower. If you don't do something, you know, you should hear me play the piano. It's actually pretty miserable because I don't do it enough. That doesn't mean that I don't have a sense of how the keyboard works or that after some practice, I can't get back on the page. But we've always known about the summer slump and we can anticipate. I don't think it's about testing and establishing that our kids are much slower now. I think the thing that we need to do as educators is to ensure that they get on the page with a lot of text. So how do we do that? I'm actually going to skip this slide, which shows that it doesn't take a lot to get much better at reading. But I do want to say that I'm actually giving you, if you need a little post-it note, um, I can actually send one to you. But if um, you don't, I'm saying don't fuss about all the various strategies. Reading is not like mathematics, where particular algorithms might have been missed during this sheltering in place. What kids missed was the experience of building knowledge and of becoming even more automatic in their thinking with text. We've got to increase immensely the reading kids are doing. And I want to underscore this reading needs to be knowledge-centered, not diffuse. And I want to distinguish here between a knowledge-centered curriculum and what you're seeing here again. I'm emphasizing throughout this talk today that knowledge is about narrative as well as informational text. We're finding out stories of the past. We're also finding out stories of things people are doing around marine life. That's different than a knowledge diffuse where every single text in a program has a different topic. These aren't bad topics. Please don't think that I'm, um, you know, railing against these topics. What I'm saying is that when I'm not a good reader, every topic presents a new set of rare words. And keep remembering, they keep coming at you three to four to five per hundred. So what that means is, if that's what's happening, and I only know a few core, well, 88% of the words, that's not just a few, that's actually pretty good. That means that I'm always attending to those words I don't know, and I never get very automatic with the new words, nor with the words that are going to keep appearing over and over again. And keep remembering when I showed you this chart that we keep adding word families as kids go up the craze. Okay, so what does it mean? What's the advantage of knowledge centered? Well, here you're actually seeing a summary of what I just talked about. Text becomes more accessible when words are repeated. So if I'm just picking up words in, incidentally in text, I actually have to have, see them a couple times. And what I'm saying is by continually presenting new topics, we've been taking away from our students the opportunity to become good at a group of words that they can recognize. And we've also not been helping them build the background knowledge. And we know in the work coming out of the Reading for Understanding uh, project that was just finished about a year ago from the um, Institute for Educational Sciences, we, we know that the knowledge that you have about a topic is what determines your comprehension. And it's not about us telling kids about every single topic. They need to learn to use text to do that. 
Okay, this gives you an example of um, how a set of knowledge base, we keep adding, I haven't shown you the words that are repeated across the text, but what happens is we keep adding as we read more books on a topic, vocabulary, and we keep seeing other words that are repeated that then become more accessible to me. That's different, and please don't think that I'm saying these aren't good words. They're interesting words, they're interesting topics. But for the kid at the 25th, 10th, or 5th percentile, these words are excruciatingly painful to figure out, which is why the teacher often reads it to you. And you're really not going to have gotten any memory or any skill with recognizing those words if it's been through a listening situation. So how do you find some of these texts online, digitally, that can help you with this? What happened in mid-March when many of you left your classrooms is you didn't know you weren't going to go, be going back. So there wasn't a major distribution of the texts in your classroom. So you've had to rely on things that are online. And I spent an enormous amount of time trying to find out what's free online. It turns out there are not a whole lot of quality narratives. It's hard to write a quality narrative. That's exciting, has rich, wonderful language that people are willing to give their copyright over. Now, at Text Project, everything that's there is open access, which means you can use it for free. Okay, If you see my name on a product, everything, all of my royalties go back into Text Project. Public education in uh, North America has been very, very good to this child of refugees. And um, I really believe in giving back. And so we've got texts in sets. So we've got about 400 texts and they sit in different conceptual groups. All of them are informational. I've gotten, I know how to write good informational text that's compelling and accessible. It's harder to do that with stories. So here's talking points for kids where you actually get some very different points of view around the same topic. In the one that I just showed you, the summer reads, where there are, I think, um, 20 some books, they develop over a couple different passages, a concept. And all of these texts have been written so that when you see a rare word, like the word mound in baseball, it's gonna be repeated hopefully within the passage and also across passages. Okay, uh, another one is, uh, FYI for kids, which are one pagers, and we have them, you can gather them or uh, connect them by topic. Another source right now is the material that Scholastic has put online for school closures. Scholastic has just an enormously rich library. Those people have knowledge, right? In books, just an incredibly rich store of knowledge, and they've made some of it available to you. What I found when I looked at it is that it was very helpful for me. And each of the things I'm showing you took me about 10 minutes to put together. So for grades three to five, I actually went in across, tech, uh, across the topics for the different days and weeks and pulled things together so we could have a conversation about something that was shared. And I wanna point out that because they've got access to such great books, there are also some outstanding narratives here. Big Red Lollipop, I think is just fabulous. So there are these topics. I actually started putting together some of text project material together with some of the scholastic material. Um, I, in another presentation, could tell you a lot about how we want to teach kids about different groups of words like idioms and multiple meaning words, compound words. We don't have time for that today. Another source is readworks.org. Um, I do want to point out that um, it saddens me that they've made the listening component, um, very prominent, but at readworks.org, this was a project that I worked with them on. They have um, read an article a day and they have clusters of articles in five to six articles for a week. One of the things I was going to really emphasize and haven't said yet is I'm not suggesting that these topics have to be like, take up the whole year. You know, like it's not about doing everything around the rainforest. What I'm saying here is that we want Rather than these cross the board, you know, every book has a different topic. We want to develop 
some key ideas, and most importantly, we want students to document and celebrate what they've learned. I think especially in a virtual environment, the documentation is really critical. I've given some webinars on the documentation, and you'll see here that um, some of the ways things I talk about are journals, word maps. I'm really super into doing word networks or word maps. Um, there are also, I hope that we get to empty out our libraries if we're going to blended environments over the fall and that we replace them with books that kids have made. This is a book that a, a teacher posted online that kids had made with a paper bag. I also think that using kids' um, interest in, you know, phones is a great way for them to document some of the things that they know. Celebrations is a whole nother topic. Recognizing what kids have learned and also celebrating. Um, I think it's also important to supplement those digital resources with paper uh, books. Here's an example of some of my favorites that have to do with the topic of challenges that I pulled the articles from. Uh, I have some ideas around um, level books where I think we have the most diversity of topics and that creates the biggest problems for kids at the beginning levels, but I just simply don't have time to talk about it because I wanna to talk to you about the fact that for some kids, access to digital programs is really essential at this time. Not for all day, not all the time, but for some kids, their ability to attend during this really stressful time in our lives has increased. And even if you were to have the kids there for six hours a day, it's going to be really hard to monitor some kids. One of the reasons we do a lot of oral reading for them um, is that we don't know if they're really reading. And a digital device can actually monitor that. Scholastic's been really generous. And as you see here, any royalties that come from my conversations about this will go back into a special fund. Maybe that's the Chardonnay fund. I don't know. No, I'm... I. One shouldn't try to um, do any kind of um, humor on a webinar. And those of you who know me know that I um, don't ever know when to not do that. So, um, but the word program actually has taken these concepts of those big ideas. They've really taken a chance on it. And um, many of you know me well enough to know that when my name is on it, if you have a name like Alfreda Hildegard, you have to be careful where you put it. So um, what you're seeing here is that within each of these themes, the same topics like animals are covered. So what you're doing is it's um, Brunner's spiral curriculum. You're getting more and more elaborated in the vocabulary and the ideas that you have. So in third grade, as I showed you, it was about marine animals. Okay, so at every level, you're adding on some words. And you'll remember in that slide that I showed you, all of the word families don't appear at once. So even the words that aren't specific to um, animals are gradually brought in across these levels. I think this is just amazing. And as I showed you, the texts on the left are part of the digital program. These texts have been written in the model that I showed you where we ensure that kids get good at the core vocabulary. And when rare words appear, you've got to have interesting rare words, as you see with this, this name here. We um, actually ensure that rare words are not just seen a single time. Furthermore, Scholastic's been lovely enough to open up their wonderful library and to make available books that relate to the topic. So kids are reading beyond that topic. I think this is so powerful. You're developing body of knowledge. And this isn't an all day program. It's like 15 to 20 minutes a day, but you're getting some chance, especially for the kids who have such hope and who didn't gain the foundation they need. As you saw with the kids at the five percentile group, you're getting the opportunity to get back onto the page or to get onto the page and to stay there. Uh, I want to point out that there are some great games in this program. And this is another feature of mine. Um, there is never a word presented when there isn't 
you know, I've just lost my little um, things to move forward. And I don't know what I just did. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm still on. So sorry. So my point here is, uh, oh, and, and also reflecting my um, my interest in um, in humor. There's a great, great set of jokes that kids are involved in. Because jokes are basically about multiple meanings of words, right? And, and idioms. Okay, um, this is my last point. And I hope that virtually you've been able to read to your kids. I'm not suggesting a set of books for everybody at this point. That is so inappropriate. But I think this is an important time for us to bring in children's literature that reminds us of what we care about, who we are, what we've shared, what's unique about us. Um, I hadn't known about um, FDR and this wonderful man who mentored him and was actually critical in FDR's work on, on the um, Indian restoration of lands during his presidency. But I'm suggesting that poetry, ways in which we can read aloud to our kids in virtual context. This isn't reading aloud the instructional text that I was talking about. This is reading aloud incredible literature. And I think this is a great homework assignment. Some of our best actors and actresses have read some incredible books on, on storylineonline.org. And you remember the orgs? That always means you don't have to pay things for it or you shouldn't have to. Um, Shorty, Trombone Short, Shorty is one of my favorite books. Um, I hadn't known about this book um, um, as fast as words could fly. I was just so incredibly impressed with that. Uh, I'm reminding you that Audible, as long as the schools are closed, are presenting not necessarily their best books. I noticed that Harry Potter, read by Jim Dale, wasn't available. But <clears throat> I think some of these books, they've got just fabulous readers. Some of the books are also in Spanish. So I recommend that you look at that. So what have I talked about today? Okay. My points are, I've actually put them up on a big board here so that I can see them. You know, words are central to who we are. It's all about knowledge. We need to have our students read more. I don't think in every classroom we were reading enough before. I think we've gotten intimidated by all the strategies and all the things we think we should be doing. I'm saying now I'll give you a sticky note and give you permission to just let that go for right now and get kids onto the page, have them learning things, having them share things. For some kids, a digital program is, and all digital programs aren't going to be equal in terms of how, the opportunities they give kids. I think that can be important. And finally, what I've said is, let's use literature to t to tell to to give us solace in a really hard time in our country. So here are my landmarks. I want to give remind you that this is text project. It's textproject.org. And I'm going to stop with this slide. I think we're giving you access to the, an article that just came out in Reading Teacher. If you send me your small change, I'll send many more than three th free copies. Uh, it just depends on how long my 70-year-old um, husband is willing to stand at, um, at the uh, post office to, to mail books. But um, we'll send as many as we can. Send me a small change. I won't keep the addresses. I won't, you won't be hearing from me again with my holiday letter, for example, which I might say is pretty awesome. But, um, and don't say when you <laughs> write in your small change, and now I also want to be on your holiday letter. Um, you guys have been so generous to me. I've seen a generosity um, in, in teachers that is, you've always been generous, but so generous. And for listening to me, with these ideas, I want so much to help you in helping the kids who come to our school with hope. Thank you very much. Freddie, this was excellent. And I'm gonna jump back on. Um, before we get to some questions, I'm gonna share a little bit more about Scholastic Word, the program that Scholastic worked on with 
uh, Dr. Freddie Hebert, which, you know, when Freddie talks about enjoyment and engagement, we worked so closely on this program and we play tested, and I'm using that word very clearly, we play tested this program with students throughout the entire development. Because as Freddie mentioned, it's got some really great games. I watch my kindergartner, he loves to tell the jokes. So does my second grader. To them, that's one of their favorite parts. Um, but to share a little bit, and I think you got this from everything that Freddie shared today around the importance of words, but this idea around words connecting concepts to ideas and ideas to knowledge. And our goal is to build knowledge um, in service of comprehension, right? And in service of just understanding the world better. And that is the goal of Scholastic Word. As I mentioned, it stands for Words Open Reading Doors. Uh, Freddie shared with you the map, the themes that start in kindergarten and go all the way up through grade five. So as students start in the lower grades, they work through the same topics, but their vocabulary will continually increase. And the Suzanne, I think an uh, important thing, if you go back to that last slide, is is that kids in the games, it's not just a game for the sake of having fun. The games provide them not only with knowledge about words, but also they get to see those words over and over again. So they're getting really automatic with the meanings and with the word recognition, which I think is just so cool. Thanks, Freddie. That's re I, and I agree. It is so cool. And and that's where this next slide. So in each theme, and this is one of the places where I think it really shows the power of the program. Because within Scholastic Word, students will complete a placement activity that places them in one of two texts, either on grade level or simplified. Students will go through the entire theme flow for a fiction text and then a nonfiction text. And as Freddie mentioned, they're going to see these words in more than one context. So the core words and the more words that Freddie mentioned earlier, these students are going to work through and be exposed to the core words and more words in two different contexts, in a fiction and a nonfiction context. And as they go through the theme flow, after they take that placement activity, they choose to read the fiction or nonfiction passage. Then they sort those words into mega clusters. And, they, and it's done through context. And then they go into the vocabulary activities, which are really very fun and engaging games that provide so much data for teachers to use to inform instruction. So as students play this game, teachers capture all of this data so they really get a sense of how students are doing. And I saw a lot of wonderful messages on the in the chat around different programs that um, all of you love. And at Scholastic, with our digital solutions, we, we really felt that the data was an important component of everything we built, especially with Scholastic Word. And I'm going to just go to this next slide where we provide educators with this data to really help inform instruction. We saw lots of questions around um, helping students with learning disabilities and special needs and really being able to pinpoint Students' strengths and weaknesses is one way that we can help students grow. Uh, and that's one of the things we do with Scholastic Word. So I'm not going to take up any more time because I know there's lots of questions and we're almost out of time. But I want to try to, at minimum, get to a couple questions that came into the question box. And my apologies because we are at 4 o'clock. But I am going to read, Freddie, a couple different questions to you from the question and answer that we've gotten from our wonderful audience of learners today. Um, here's a great one. It seems that learning these vocabulary words presumes a child's ability to categorize successfully. At what age would you begin this type of instruction? And what would you suggest for the language impaired or delayed students who don't have strong categorizing skills? Wow, that's a great question. Um, as as you saw on the program, we're um, starting that at kindergarten. And whether, I mean, I think it's an important thing to involve children in. I think it's an important thing to model. 
I think that that might be one of the key things that you get in school is helping you see different categories. One of the things, um, if we were to do a session just on the semantic clusters, is that, you know, there can be different ways in which you categorize things. And that needs to be recognized, too. I hope, Suzanne, that I get the questions and that if you visit us both through something at Scholastic, but at Text Project, this is a good time for me to start writing some blogs. And I will do my very best to answer as many of these questions. You could also send some of them in to the small changes. I, I, I apologize for, I wanted to tell you so much. <laughs> and I went a little overboard, so in terms of- No, time. it's okay. Actually, Freddie, and I'm gonna copy all these questions and make sure you get them. Um, but you, one question that we did get is what, what do we send to small change? I guess, um, not everyone understood when you said, send your small changes, what you meant by that. Well, is there something that I talked about today that ignited, um, reminded, or actually even was an aha. And that is something that in the context you're in, you might give it a go. That might be something that you think about in terms of of making a change, small one in your classroom. I mean, it can be, you know, like I'm going to do a read aloud. That's I don't think that's a big one, but I'm going to pick some really um, books that I care a lot about to do a, a virtual read aloud to my students. So that that's an example of a small change. Great, and if if you'll. Um... Give us one more. I think that would be great. Um, let's see. There's so many wonderful questions here. It's really hard to choose. Uh, you had Anglo-Saxon words and common words. Could you explain why Anglo-Saxon? Typically, in my presentations, I go into more detail. I have my best slide ever um, is of... of three foods that tells the story of English. So English starts out as a Germanic or ag the Anglo-Saxons who came to Great Britain were, were Germanic tribe. So German starts out to be the core language of English. Okay. And those words typically were short words. Okay. Like words like pat at uh, sat are examples of, um, Anglo-Saxon or Germanic words where the AT doesn't have a shared meaning. That's different in the French layer, which came to Great Britain, uh, you know, several hundred years later. And for a while, Great Britain, the, the country was ruled by the Normans, who spoke a form of French. So, you know, the aristocrats spoke French, and we added that French layer. And then with the re Renaissance, most languages added this set of Greek or Latin based words to describe really scientific um, processes. So the Anglo-Saxon words, I, I've done a lot of writing about that. You know, that article that um, I hope you got a, um, a connection to uh, on the core vocabulary, we'll describe some of that for you. And that's something that um, I can actually provide some more specific references, Suzanne. Great. This is so wonderful, Freddie, and I know that um, even more questions are coming in, but we are out of time, and I want to be respectful of everyone on this call, so I'm just going to go through some of the wrap-up. Um, as Don't forget to join the online community for this ed webinar. That's where you're going to be able to view and share the recording of what we just saw. You'll be able to take the CE quiz. You'll also be able to download the slides. So I know we had a lot of wonderful questions asking about getting these slides and being able to actually get the chat. So that's going to be available in that, um, that community. And that is it for us, Freddie. As always, you are an inspiration. We are so lucky to be able to learn from you. And I honestly feel that Scholastic has been blessed to be able to be a partner with you mm -hmm. to get this research into the lives of students in a really fun and engaging way. So I thank you for that. And thank I thank you. you, everyone, who joined us today. Yeah, thank you so much for your generosity, everybody. Small changes at textproject.org if you want to be in touch. 
Thank you.